In this video, we're going to cover the utility suite within the ACPF toolbox. The utilities have been developed so that you can be taken step by step through a database building process. At the end of it all, you will have a complete ACPF database with watershed boundaries, field boundaries, a DEM, and soils and land use data ready to use to run the ACPF tools. There are over 8,000 watersheds where soil and land use databases currently exist. However, that leaves over 71,000 watersheds in the lower 48 states where data has not been compiled. The ACPF utilities are going to solve this issue by allowing you to build your own file geodatabase from scratch. So to begin, we're going to create a file geodatabase, and we're also going to talk a little bit about coordinate systems and the importance of knowing your appropriate coordinate system for the watershed that you're going to be working with. We're also, throughout this process, going to be bringing in data from outside sources that most likely will be projected in a different coordinate system. So I'm going to go over some methods to ensure that you're always using the correct one. All right, so a good way to ensure that you're going to be uh, exporting data in the right coordinate system is to set your map document coordinate system. So in ArcMap, you'll click on your data frame, which is usually named layers, right click on it, go down to properties, and then you can enter to this tab uh, called coordinate system. And you can see that right now no coordinate system has been assigned to this data frame. And it would be dependent on whichever data set you added first. So say you added something from the USGS and it was projected in Albers, that would be your data frame's official coordinate system. So the way we can set it is I'm going to go into projected coordinate systems and I work in Iowa mostly, so I want to use UTM 83 zone 15. So I'm going to select that and hit apply and OK. So now my data frame is set to the correct uh, coordinate system. You could do the same thing in Arc Pro as well. Now we can start creating our file geo database. There are many ways you can go about doing this and probably the most common one is to go into ARC Catalog. And you can also do this within ARC Map itself using the catalog window. So I'm just going to work from here. Um, so what you first want to do is create a base folder. And if you're going to be using ACPF, it's good to work off directly off your hard drive. So I'm going to do off my C drive here. I'm going to right click here, hit New, Folder. And I'm just going to name this folder ACPF, followed by my 12-digit HUC ID. Okay, so there it is. And then once I'm ready to create the file geo database, once again, I will just right-click, hit New, and I'm going to create a file geo database. And the naming convention that we suggest is ACPF, followed by that 12-digit HUC ID. All right. There are a few other ways that you can create a file geodatabase too that I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can also use the create file geodatabase tool within Arc Toolbox, or if you are familiar with Python and ArcPy, you may use the ArcPy scripting tool create file geodatabase under data management. All right, so now that we have our file geodatabase and we understand the importance of coordinate systems, let's go and create our watershed boundary. So to make this easy on yourself, you're going to want to find a source data set to create the boundary feature class from. We suggest using the USGS provided watershed boundary data set. So if you Google USGS Watershed Boundary Dataset, you should eventually land on this page where you will then want to scroll down until you see the Download by Link section. 
Once you're there, you're going to want to select the download the WBD by entire nation link. And that'll take you to where you can download a zipped up uh, file geo database that has all the Huck 12 watershed boundaries. As an example, I've added the USGS's National Watershed Boundary Dataset, and these are all the Huck 12s for the US. And I just want to show you real quick if we go into this feature class's properties, uh, we can see that it uh, doesn't have a projected coordinate system, it is just in this geographic coordinate system 83. So if I did not have my data frame set uh, to a particular coordinate system and I went to export these out, the default option would likely be to keep it in this projection. But now, when we go and open the attribute table and make a selection, so I'm just going to select a random Huck 12 right now, apply, and we can zoom to that layer and see it right there. Now when I go to export this data, I have the option to export my selected feature based on the data frame's coordinate system. So I know now that it's going to be in my preferred coordinate system and not whatever that source data's uh, coordinate system was. So now we need to direct it to the correct place. So I'll just go to my C. I'm going to create another root real quick. There we go. And whoops. I will create a file geodatabase. And then once I'm in here, what we name our watershed boundary is BND followed by that 12 digit Huck ID. So I'll hit save. Everything looks good. We're exporting the selected feature. So I'll hit OK. Yes, add it to the map document. And now we can remove uh, that USGS watershed boundary data set. We are left with our watershed boundary that we want to work with. Similarly in Pro, if I go through the same process of adding that data set I've already set uh, my data frames coordinate system to my UTM 15 and I've applied this selection. Now when I go to export this feature and I come up to the copy feature tool, I just need to make sure that I go to my environments tab, drop this down and choose current map for my, my coordinate system and we can see that it is respecting that setting. So you want to make sure that the watershed boundary that you just exported is in the correct coordinate system. If you did not set your map document coordinate system beforehand, or you just forgot to select that little dot, it's going to be in some generic geographic coordinate system. So choose one. You can feel free to use the UTM and set your correct zone or another projected coordinate system, but just make sure you do set the correct one that you need for your watershed boundary before you move on. All right, so now it is time to create the field boundary feature class, and there are two methods that you can use. You can either use an existing source field boundary data set uh, and this can be CLUs or polygons from your local assessor office. Uh, these will likely require editing. Or you may use um, a new feature class that you will create and then digitize each field. The field boundaries within the existing ACPF Geo databases were generated from the FSA Common Land Unit datasets, and that's the CLUs, and this was pre the 2008 Farm Bill. So for this first method, I'm going to show how you would create field boundaries based on an existing source data like that CLU dataset. 
So first off, you need to add that source field boundary data set to your map document. You need to select the fields that intersect the watershed boundary feature class. To use that uh, by using select by location. You'll then right click on that source data set and go down to data, export data. Again, you want to export selected features and navigate to that file geodatabase. And you're going to want to name this FB, followed by the 12 digit HUC ID underscore edit. This will be the feature class that you'll be editing in the future. All right, once that looks good, you hit OK and export it to your map document. And then you can remove that source data set, and there are your field boundaries. If you're creating the feature class from scratch, it's not a problem. Navigate to your file geodatabase, right click, hit new, and select feature class. Again, you're going to want to name this FB, followed by the 12 digit HUC ID, and then followed by an underscore edit. The feature class's alias will be the same as the feature class name. Make sure that you're doing a polygon feature and hit next. Select the appropriate coordinate system. Next, next, and then hit finish. Now your feature class has been added. All right, so now you need to actually digitize these field boundaries. So you'll right click and edit the feature and select start editing. And then before you can begin digitizing, you do need to add a useful data such as aerial imagery or uh, any kind of land use data you may have. So I've just added some infrared aerial imagery. I'm going to zoom into an area and then I um, am just going to fix this boundary real quick. And then I'll go to my Create Features window that you can open in the Editor Toolbar. Select Polygon and begin digitizing. And you just do this by clicking and generating that polygon shape that you would like to represent the field. You may need to adjust the contrast or brightness of the imagery or adjust how far you're zoomed in to really determine. But the main thing you want to focus on here is digitizing the boundary as best as you can based on the land use type. You can see here I'm avoiding digitizing a majority of the forest area. So this polygon is mostly represented by agricultural land use. And I'll just do one more for an example. So we see this one's a little bit easier. It's almost a perfect square. And then you double click to end the polygon creation. When you're done, make sure you hit save edits and then stop editing. So now we're able to create our buffered boundary. The buffered boundary is a data set that is a 1000 meter buffer around a unioned field boundary and watershed boundary data set. This buffered boundary will be used as a mask for subsequent soils, land use, and elevation data. The 1000 meters is used to capture the full extent of the watershed and truly represent its flow paths and land cover. This data set is going to be created using the field boundary data set and that watershed boundary data set. So now it is extremely important to make sure that both of those are in the correct coordinate system. If you try to union them together and they have two separate coordinate systems, your data is just going to be wrong. So make sure that you have taken the precautionary steps and uh, ensured that they are in the same coordinate system. All right, so I have my field boundary and watershed boundary data set added. If I check their properties real quick, I can see that this one is in the right coordinate system. And so is my field boundaries data set. So everything looks good to go. So the first step here is to go over to your ARC toolbox, expand analysis tools, and then expand the overlay tool set. And what we're going to choose is the union uh, analysis tool. We're going to input both of these boundary data sets. 
at the moment. It doesn't matter where it goes to, so that is fine. And everything looks good. So I'm just going to hit OK, let it run. And then we uh, will go into Proximity Tool Set and select the Buffer Tool. We'll grab that Union Output, put it in there. Now we do want to keep this output, so I'm going to navigate to my file geodatabase and we're going to name this one BUF followed by that 12 digit HUC ID. Let's see. And here we wanted to make sure that the linear un unit is 1000 meters and we need to select dissolve type all. And this is just going to make sure that uh, you don't have strange little buffers coming off of each of those uh, field boundaries. It's just going to look at the whole feature as one. So then we'll hit OK. Let it run. And then once it's done running, we have our buffered boundary. So we can remove this union output, make this transparent, and see that it does encompass our field boundaries and watershed boundary in all of its entirety. All right, so now we have our buffered boundary and we are able to run the first utility, which is the get ACPF soils data tool. This tool will use that buffered boundary to extract the GSERGO raster and also create three soils attribute tables and it's going to automatically add them to your file geodatabase. All right, so we'll navigate to the version 3 ACPF toolbox, go to the utilities tool set, and open that first utility. And all we got to do is add the buffered boundary and hit OK. You can go into the results and see how it's doing, where it's at. And once it's succeeded, it'll show you. And then to view these data sets, just navigate to your file geodatabase, and you can add that raster and add those tables if you wish to look at the attributes there. Now we can run the second utility, which is the get NAS CDL by years. And this will also use the buffered boundary to extract land use rasters for each selected year. So similar to the get soils, we'll navigate to the utilities tool set, but now I'll open the second utility. We add the buffered boundary and now we'll select at least six years. I'm selecting the six most recent. And this tool also requires the ACPF CDL lookup table. And that's under that ACPF version 3 root. We hit OK. And wait for it to run. This tool may take a while to gather data from each year. And then once it's finished, each of those rasters will be automatically added to your file geodatabase, so we can go there and just take a look. So let's add this most recent one. We can see it has specific uh, land use there, and this will be very useful for editing our field boundaries later on. All right, so now we have our GSERGO data set. Most importantly, we have that land use data set with the rasters, and hopefully you also have an aerial imagery data set because those two are going to be vital for our next step, which is to update our edited field boundaries. Okay, so I've added the most recent uh, CDL raster, which is 2017. I'm going to start an editing session on my field boundaries and find an area where a field needs to be edited. And based on the imagery here and the CDL raster, I believe that this field needs to be split. So I'm going to make sure it's the only selectable layer and select it. I will choose the Cut Polygon tool in the Editor toolbar. And then using my imagery, I'm going to split this polygon where I see fit. And again, I believe that that top polygon should be split. So now I'm going to split it right along what looks like to be a little wooded riparian corridor. And there we go. Once I feel like everything is complete, 
I will save my edits and then stop editing. And we can double check and see that things look good. So now I'll navigate to my utilities and open the third utility of edit or update edited field boundaries. I'll add that edited field boundary. Uh, choose the smallest size I want a field to be and then use the ACPF CDL lookup table and let it run. Now this tool runs in the foreground, so while it's running, you may not click on your map document in the background. And then once it finishes, uh, we can hit close and then go to our file geodatabase and we can see that a crop history table has been added, uh, a new field boundary data set that respects those edits that we just made. And then we also have our land use table that reflects the last six years of land use data that we have. Like all good JS analysis processes, you can cut a few corners to do some quick checks on your data. One thing that we suggest doing is joining that crop history uh, table output to your field boundaries and then doing a select by attribute based on that percent. I'm going to suggest your most recent years, so maybe percent 17, uh, is less than 75 and that the is ag is not equal to zero and that the acreage is at least for me i'm going to do 40 acres but that's up to you any field that has been selected something may be wrong with it because the percent of the dominant crop was less than 75 percent something uh, is up it may need splitting like in this example where the fields selected in yellow have been split along those lines uh, shown in red. So now after editing my field boundaries again, I would rerun that update edited field boundary tool and these fields would likely be more accurate and I would run the same uh, select by attribute check again using the crop history table and uh, go through and just make sure that these seem better and that hopefully the dominant crop is occupying at least 75% of the field. So at this point, you essentially have a completed geodatabase. You now have all of the base data layers that would be in a normal ACPF file geodatabase that could be downloaded off of our land use viewer. However, there's still one necessary uh, data set that you need before you can run the ACPF, and that is your elevation data set. So I'm just going to go over some basic rules behind this, some requirements, and give you some suggestions for how to process it. A DEM is also not provided in any ACPF data set. And there are multiple sources where you can go and get a DEM. So it is up to you to find whatever source may be most suitable for you or just what is available for you. If you're going to continue and run the ACPF tools afterwards, then there are a few requirements. First, horizontal uh, resolution of the DEM must be in whole meters. We highly recommend that the resolution also be between two and five meters. If it is less than two meters, there is a little gained as far as accuracy, but the processing time will greatly increase. And if you go above five meters, uh, the resolution is too coarse to really accurately gather flow data. The Z factor must also be known, so you must know what your vertical units are in, and we highly suggest using uh, centimeter integer Z units. The DEM must be in the same coordinate, coordinate system as the rest of the base layers. All of your base layers should be in the same coordinate system. And then finally, the DEM extent should be the same as the buffered watershed boundary. So the hunt for good elevation data can sometimes be frustrating. So I'm just going to run through pretty quickly two examples. 
if you're in Iowa, you're in luck because the Iowa State uh, GIS facility has worked with us to develop um, this website where you can get two meter DEMs by Huck 12. So you would simply click on this link to use their tool, which would take you to this viewer. And as you zoom in, uh, Huck 12s are then delineated. There we go. And then you just follow these tabs. You can simply choose to download a geodatabase. You can choose the P class or S class, which back here on that home page, it goes over the difference between these. The P class has gone through some general pit fill and hole punching, which is good for hydro conditioning. Uh, they just ask that you enter a bit of information. So if I selected this Hug 12 here and then entered my information and push download, I would now have an elevation model for this watershed. And you can search by Huck 12. You can even search by address if you'd like. So this is a very convenient tool to get elevation data from. It's not always this simple. Here is an example of where I would get a Missouri elevation data set from. They have uh, this website that has, again, a tool where you can go and download a DEM by county. And as you can see from this PDF, not all their counties have DEMs available. Sometimes you'd be working with point clouds still, and some counties simply just are missing data. So for them, I would follow this link to go to their download tool. It has some information in the beginning to tell you how to use it. And I'm just going to zoom in to Franklin County and I will click it and hit download LiDAR and it'll begin the downloading process. Now I have previously downloaded this, so I'm going to jump into ArcMap to show you what to do next. Okay, so I'm in my ArcMap session. I've added Franklin County's elevation model. And first I just want to know some things about it. So right away I can see that my cell size uh, is one meter. I know it's in meters. Um, the coordinate system is UTM, conveniently zone 15. And I can see that my linear unit is in uh, meters. So right away, I know that I'm probably going to want to resample my final elevation model to two meters just to improve my processing time. Another important thing to check, like I just did, is which coordinate system it is in. And it will not always be right here in the metadata, but it is good to double check uh, which vertical units it is using. So I know by looking at the values here that the vertical units are in feet, which is okay. But if I wanted them to be in centimeters, I would use the raster calculator to convert that over. But for now, I'm going to focus on extracting this. So in our toolbox, we'll go down to Spatial Analyst and we'll choose the Extraction toolset. I'll select the Extract by Mask tool and now we'll just put in this elevation data set. I am going to use this Huck 12 boundary that I got from the National Watershed Boundary data set from USGS, and then I'm going to navigate to my file geodatabase. So I've created one here, and I'm going to name this E for elevation 1 meter, since that's its uh, horizontal resolution at the moment, and then followed by its Huck 12 digit code. Hit save, and hit OK, and let it run. All right, and now if we remove this county data set, we can see that we are left with uh, this data set. And another good thing to check is the extent of your DEM. 
A quick way to do this is to just right click on this and hit zoom to layer. This looks good. If when you do hit zoom to layer and it's still the extent of the county or whatever the original data set was, you're going to want to fix that. And you can rerun that and adjust the environments uh, behind that extract by mass tool. And then briefly, like I mentioned earlier, if I wanted to make this a two meter DEM to improve processing time, I would go to uh, the data management toolbox. Um, I would then go down to raster and into raster processing and choose the tool resample. So I would input this data set, uh, make sure it's going to the correct place and I'm going to make it two meters so I'm going to change this to E2M followed by the HUC12 code. Uh, the output cell size I want to be two in both directions and then the resampling technique. Feel free to read up on uh, resampling techniques on your own but briefly I'll just explain I'm going to choose the bilinear technique as it is, it is better for continuous data like this is. Nearest neighbor is more preferred for discrete data, say like land use classification. So that may not be most appropriate here. So I'm going to go with bilinear and then hit OK. Let it run. And now that's finished running. I can remove this and you can see that the cell size has been changed to two meters, which is appropriate. And then finally, if I did want this raster to have its vertical units in centimeters instead of feet, I would use the raster calculator. And so there we go into spatial analyst, uh, open the map algebra to tool set, and I would open up raster calculator. And another thing to note, is that this elevation model is a floating point, which will drastically increase my processing time. So we can take care of that as well at the moment by selecting int and then choosing our elevation model. And then the conversion factor from feet to centimeters would be to times this by 30.48. And then we'll have our output roster. I go to my file of geodatabase and I'm going to name this one E two meter final, followed by that 12 digit hook. I hit save, okay, and let it run. And now when that's finished, we can already see that our units have changed. We can open up the properties and I'll confirm that the pixel type is no longer floating point, it is integer. So this elevation data set is now ready to go. Real quick, I'm just gonna give a shout out and say check your metadata. It is super important. You cannot ignore this. As you can see, uh, with what we just did, it's valuable for finding out what the horizontal units are, what the vertical units are. When was this data taken? Was it right before a huge flood that drastically changed the whole landscape? These are things that you need to look into. And if you're having trouble finding the metadata, usually it is on the website that you downloaded it from in a PDF, but if you still can't find it, contact the GIS person for that state or county, whatever it may be, and I'm sure that they will gladly help you find out this information. But do not skip this step. Pay attention to your metadata. And finally, it is time to run the fourth utility, which is project the file geo database to a new spatial reference. This may be an optional step for you. If you set your coordinate system in your data frame and exported everything out of that and you know everything is in the correct coordinate system, then you don't need to do this. But say you added supplementary data that is in a different projection or you're just not sure, do this final step to ensure that your file geodatabase, all its base layers are in the same coordinate system. So at this point, you should have a final geodatabase that looks like this. 
and you may also have your elevation data set sitting there right in between your crop history table and your field boundary data set. If you have any additional data sets that are named maybe FB followed by your hook uh, 12 digit underscore edit or maybe LU6 plus the 12 digits underscore original or ridge or any of those intermediate data sets, now is the time to delete them. All right, so we have our final geodatabase that we're happy with. So the first step is to create a new directory where our newly projected file geodatabase will sit in. Uh, we all can call this whatever you want. I'm going to call it projected UTM-15 to represent the coordinate system I'm going to use, followed by ACPF and that 12-digit HUC. So once I have that new directory, I can go up to the ACPF toolbox, open utilities, and open that fourth utility. I'm going to input my uh, original file geo database with all my base layers. I'm going to set the output directory to that new folder I just created, and then direct the spatial reference to the correct coordinate system, which for me is UTM zone 15. So just navigate to that and hit OK, let it run. We can go to the results window to see where it's at. It's going to reproject all the rasters and feature classes, and then it's just going to simply copy over all of the tables that are a part of it. So once it finishes running, we can go to that directory and see our new file geo database. And we can just double check by opening the properties of these feature classes and um, of the rasters to see that it's actually been projected to the correct coordinate system. All right, and that's it. You now should have a file geo database that is complete with all of the base data layers that you need to begin running the ACPF or doing any other analysis that you wish to do with these. It is a powerful database to begin with, so have fun with it. And then here is just a brief recap of all the steps we went through to create that file geo database.